Travis Wayne Goodsell. Facsimile number three before I shower and shave this morning. <clears throat> Uh, we'll start with Abraham. Joseph Smith never translated it. It's not in the text of Abraham. He got to facsimile number one and two as the text illustrates different information from the Genesis account. But uh, with facsimile number three, he never got to it. Didn't finish didn't get to the book of Joseph, didn't finish. But he did give an explanation, and the explanation reveals his manner of translation. He's focusing on the characters, not the text. Because each of the figures are the characters within a picture glyph containing both text and uh, hieroglyphic characters in the large size. These large size characters are not contained in any sign list by Egyptologists. Egyptologists therefore don't translate any of these characters unless there's text accompanying them. And when we get to it, we'll go over the translations by Michael Rhodes uh, regarding this facsimile. But figure one, Abraham sitting upon Pharaoh's throne. Joseph got that correct, didn't he? What does it mean to be sitting in the throne of Pharaoh? It means you're Pharaoh. Make note of that, because Egyptologists don't. They make note of the female Pharaoh behind them. We'll get to her. She's figure two. By the politeness of the king. I'd say it's a lot more than polite. <laughs> With a crown upon his head, representing the priesthood. Yeah. That's correct. The Amun priesthood of Pharaoh as the theocratic leader. Pay attention. An emblematic, emblematical of the Grand Presidency in Heaven. Wow, he got that correct. That is Osiris, who had been murdered by his brother Set, and who, whose death, burial, resurrection, and ascension are personified in the Egyptian temple rituals. And so now Osiris is indeed the great Pharaoh in heaven, of whom successors to the throne follow his ritual covenant path on earth in preparation for their death and ascension into heaven like Osiris. So yeah, Joseph Smith, right. Why are Egyptologists arguing Joseph is wrong? I don't understand this. With the scepter of justice and judgment in his hand. Wow, what do you know? Right again. Amazing. The flail and the shepherd's crook. And so here we go to figure two. King Pharaoh, whose name is given in the characters above his head. Wow, how did he mess that up? <laughs> That's obviously a woman, and the characters above her head indicate that she is Osir uh, Isis, the mother 
of Osiris Hor, or technically Hor Osiris, but there's some disagreement among Egyptologists on that, and the, the majority have dominated. <laughs> and so when you talk about peer review, you have to understand which peers are you are reviewing <laughs> because if you get the the wrong peers they will give incorrect insight and will reject your information that's why peer review processes are crap they need to be done away with uh, <clears throat> and so yeah I'll I'll cover that when I do my part at the end here. Figure 3 signifies Abraham in Egypt, as also given in figure 10 of facsimile number 1. He doubles down on Abraham not being in Babylon. Do you catch that? Because we've all been led astray in thinking, oh yeah, well Babylon or Abraham came from Ur of Babylon, and his, his genealogy comes through that, and then he had, he left, and whether you accept the apocryphal literature or, or about uh, the apocalypse of Abraham or other stories of Abraham about how uh, he had to leave because he destroyed the idols in the temple, calling them evil gods, destroyed his father's business, you know, it depends on what you accept as scripture. So again, peer review is crap. <coughs> and so, yeah, Joseph makes it very clear. He's not Mesopotamian. He's Egyptian. Everybody misses it. Mormon and non-Mormon Egyptologists alike. They shouldn't be called non-Mormon. Remove Mormon from the equation. Mormons are the anomaly. Figure four, Prince of Pharaoh. Uh, that's a woman too. <laughs> King of Egypt has written above the hand. Uh, it says Ma'at. Even the symbol on her head refers to Ma'at. Uh, a little oopsie there because it's switched with figure 5. Figure 5 is actually the prince of Egypt. As Shudem, as Joseph is creating his own Hebrew words here, uh, is Ma'at, a principal waiter. Notice they're holding hands. Notice she's not in the form of a scale of judgment. Egyptologists missed this. I will get to it at the end of this video when I cover my translation of the characters <coughs> that everybody misses because they're not listed in a sign list. Uh, six, Olim La, another made-up Hebrew word by Joseph. As soon as you learn a little Hebrew as he supposes, he begins to create his own Hebrew words. <laughs> and so yes, there's a key for you. Learn Hebrew, learn how Joseph understood the Hebrew characters' meanings, and thus the combinations, <clears throat> to understand. And so, a slave belonging to the prince. Well, yeah, that's Anubis. He is the escort through the temple rituals. So yes, he belongs to the prince. He's escorting him through the temple rituals. Right on target. And then figure seven. Abraham is reasoning upon the principles of astronomy in the king's court. 
Well, you do have the stars in the heaven. I notice that they're not upside down. If by chance you see a, ver a pentagram, do not let it stay. Quickly invert it upside down and smile that frown away. Because that's the way it is on the Salt Lake Temple. Shouldn't they match according to the Salt Lake Oh, right, the Egyptians were heathens. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the true church with the inverted pentagram, not those silly stars. <laughs> so, fun, fun. The Wikipedia has the translation of the texts of all the facsimiles and uh, shows the papyrus scrolls. If you don't buy John Gee's instructor's book, it has the little centerfold of the scrolls in the middle of it. Uh, the good old days of centerfolds. You just don't get those with digital. <laughs> and under translation, the papyri have been translated several times by both Mormon and non-Mormon Egyptologists. No, no. You need to put, the papyri have been translated several times by professional Egyptologists and by Mormons. <laughs> Don't classify Egyptologists as non-Mormon. Disagreements between translations are minor, kind of, and do not change the main theme of the document. You mean the Mormons cave to Egyptologists? What? The breathing permit begins with a preamble and address to the deceased whore, introducing who he is and wishing him a good burial east of Thebes. Uh, the second section is an illustration of those caring for the body on how and when the breathing permit was to be placed on horn. The last section is the main body of the breathing document. It contains ten paragraphs of various declarations of hope for a successful afterlife as well as attestations of ultimate justification and further existence. <laughs> I have justified my existence. I'm not dead yet. <laughs> the document continues, but the remaining fragments are presumed not to have survived. <laughs> we have other similar versions. We know exactly how the whole thing is supposed to be written. The traditional Book of Breathings continues for another four paragraphs. These final paragraphs typically include continued discussion of horror entering the afterlife, an abbreviated negative confession, uh, positive affirmation. I have not done this, I have not done that, I have not done this versus the Ten Commandments, which they're not even bringing up here. Thou shalt not. That's more of a negative. <clears throat> but uh, they're not telling you at this point, because if you start, as I'm starting in this video, you obviously have a prerequisite to know the genealogy of the gods that uh, Osiris murdered by Set, his wife and sister Isis uh, has sex with him or hovers over him as a bird to immaculately conceive Horus as she then has to flee into the wilderness as Set found out that she got pregnant because she carries the birthright blessing son who's supposed to take over the throne Set can't have that. He's the king now. And so Hor I, Horus, when he grows up, goes back to Egypt, 
does battle with contests with Set, beats him, and Set is banished. <coughs> and his wife, Neftes, is given to Osiris, as Osiris and Neftes uh, have an immaculate child, Anubis. Ta da! And so that's where all these characters come into play if you don't have that prerequisite knowledge. <coughs> uh, uh, where horror would proclaim before gods and demons. No! It's Ma'at. If he answers the questions wrong, then yes, the one demon, which is not really a demon, that's more of a Catholic interpositioning on the Egyptian religion. It's uh, the devourer, the destroyer, which is a hybrid of multiple animals all into one. And uh, there's 19th dynasty uh, tomb art that depict the pharaohs of those dynasties judging people you know, in this same type of scene where they fail and they go back into the spirit world, the nether world, the Amduat, uh, to wait until another resurrection attempt as they go back as swine. Referring to the story in the Gospels about the demons who uh, beg of the Jesus character uh, to inhabit the swine and then he grants it and then they go berserk and run into the Mediterranean Sea and drown. That's the 19th dynasty version that is depicted in the tombs. Uh, and so finally a proclamation of horror's purity and readiness to live forever on earth. Who's responsible for this? Bear? Uh, Germans. This would make up about two more columns. Alright, so facsimile number three. This is the Wikipedia page if I didn't tell you. The culminating vignette, also known, e also known as facsimile number three, and it's called facsimile because it's a copy of the original, thus a facsimile. Uh, in the olden days, before they were called copy machines, they were called facsimile machines. You made a facsimile. In the presentation of Hor to the Egyptian god of death and rebirth. <laughs> Who's doing this? Who's wording it this way? Bear! <laughs> Presentation of horror to his father! <laughs> and his mother, Isis! <laughs> Dear God! <laughs> Why do you have to make it so complicated? Well, I get paid the big bucks to sound official and complicated because we don't want just regular common peons taking over Egyptology and messing up the peer review <laughs> after having been judged worthy to continue existence <laughs> did he have to pay tithing to be worthy to continue his existence <laughs> it this way, Klaus. <sighs> Horror is adorned in Egyptian festival attire with a cone of perfume grease and a lotus flower on his head. <laughs> uh, 
he is escorted by the goddess of justice and order and harmony in the universe, Ma'at, and, and guide of the dead, Anubis. And as you can tell, they're not filling you in on the backstory either. They're expecting that you know the genealogy of the gods. <sighs> At the top of the scene is a row of stars representing the sky. Really? Is this where Captain Obvious appears? The presentation of the deceased. Notice, the stars are pentagrams. There have been people who want to fight and argue with me that the pentagram, as a star symbol, is more modern. Dear God. The presentation of the deceased to Osiris is a <laughs> Oh my god! Oh my god! Yeah, this was an apologist Mormon who did this. This is a common tactic of Mormon apologists to use a variation of the ad populum fallacy. Well, the majority of our of us peers say that you're wrong <laughs> and therefore we establish truth <laughs> it doesn't matter <laughs> if it's common or not that's not the point you know this is Mormons purposely putting this in here to justify the papyri as legitimate we already know it's legitimate you don't need to do this it's Joseph and whether he made a correct translation or not. That is the focus. Quit fooling around by taking people down a rabbit hole. Oh, it's a legitimate papyri. It's actual Egyptian. And this is Osiris. And this is, well, where's Abraham? Well, but this is Egyptian. And this is where Osiris, yeah, but you're not telling me where Abraham is. Well, yeah, but did you see that the Egyptians were all a that's what they do. They don't have the answer, and they don't have the courage to just come out and say, I have no clue. I'm not a real Egyptologist. I'm, I just took a couple of years, and so I just agree with what Egyptologists say. And so we help the church come up with this reasoning to say that Joseph Smith is not a translator. He's just a revelator. So anyway, it continues. The Egyptian gods and goddesses in this vignette are identified by iconography above their heads. You mean text? Osiris is adorned in the crown Atef, which combines the Hejet, the crown of Upper Egypt, where Thebes is located, the capital of Egypt. Uh, they just discovered that in the news. It's kind of cool. They finally dug it out, and so they showed it to the public in the news. And they had a, a, a ceremony taking uh, mummies to a new location. Um, that was quite the big deal this year. Uh, notice it's not the northern crown. Remember I've been talking about Paleo-Hebrew, the identification of the Nun, which is new in Paleo-Greek, which is the, the crown of, of uh, Lower Egypt, the Northern crown, not the Upper crown. This has significance in the meaning and the identification of when the language was created in Bayou. Isis has the sun disk between two cow horns. Cow's horns. Cow's horns? No. Two cow horns. One cow has two horns. 
it's not multiple horns here beyond just one cow above her head. This makes her Hathor. The identification of the character is Hathor. But the text, as Michael Rhodes translates it, uh, suggests that the scribbling uh, at the one point indicates that it's Isis. And I'm not quite sure. I can see where he gets it from. But the image is Hathor, not Isis. Because if it were Isis, she would have the throne on her head rather than the sun disk with cow horns. <clears throat> and it's not really much of a difference. It just depends on the text and what the picture glyphs are trying to portray. Because different aspects of the individual characters depends on the story that is being told. And so here, she's not just the wife of Osiris. She's the mother of Horus. Hathor. House of Horus. And that's the queen. And so <clears throat> that needs to be understood. And in her hand is a symbol of life, you mean eternal life, called the Ankh. Ma'at is denoted by a feather above her head. That was a quick change in topic. <clears throat> in the funerary tradition, it is common funerary tradition, the god Anubis is the guide to the dead, assisting in leading the deceased through the underworld. Anubis is typically portrayed with a jackal's head to include spiked ears. Yes, and it most likely was though there is no indication that this part was cut out by rats or, or damage. Um, a facsimile uh, number one uh, did have damage and the head was cut off and he would have had the Anubis head. Uh, the priests wore that in the ceremonies. They would put on the mask of the particular god. And, uh, and so, with or without a mask, doesn't matter depending on how the story is being told. Joseph tells the story of facsimile number one about an actual priest who's performing this function. So, yeah, to have it as just a regular head, perfectly acceptable. Even though the original uh, facsimile one a papyrus of the facsimile would have shown the mask being worn as if it were Anubis himself. And uh, the deceased typical the jackal's head, while the spiked ear and narrow eyes and prentice down it. That's extra stuff that you didn't even need to put in here. You're not even explaining that he's the son of Horus or um, Osiris and Nephthys. So why are you bothering to explain him? The close analysis of the printing plates of facsimile 3 indicate that the snout... So apparently we don't have the original facsimile 3. Is that what I'm hearing? And I would believe that is the case because I don't see it on the Joseph Smith papyri here. And, uh, It's un unclear, um, but he was able to translate the first section above Anubis's head, and so the damage would have been minimal, like a little strip that went right over the head or something, if that was the case. Interestingly, the invocation to Osiris at the bottom of the vignette reads from left to right, not right to left. 
Yeah, because you read in to the hieroglyphs. That's how you know which direction to go. And so on the uh, facsimile 2, you see the one uh, feather thing sticking up. That's where you start, is at the very top of the sun disk, and then you follow into the faces uh, to read right around. And Michael Rhodes had made some errors that I corrected, because I did render a translation of that. And so, yeah, as we're now going to go over Michael Rhodes's translations, uh, I have not done a check on his work, so just understand that there are potential errors. As I told you, I can sort of see where he's getting Isis, but it's too scribbly in the facsimile to clearly identify it. I do see the mouth, but, uh, yeah. Uh, so, where do we start? We start with the woman, Isis. He translates that section above her hand, the great Isis, mother of the god. And so I'm a little concerned because he starts off the great Isis, because I don't see Isis and the throne to indicate Isis. But again, it's scribbled, but uh, if he sees Mother of the God in there, it most likely could be Hathor instead of Isis. But I don't see the square with the bird, the hawk, Horus, falcon uh, within it to indicate Hathor. And uh, so then above Osiris, he says, words spoken by Osiris, the foremost of the Westerners. The Westerners refer to the dead in the Valley of the Kings. I don't know if he actually goes over this. I have to refer to his books that he had published on this. May you, Osiris, whore. When you go through the temple rituals, you get a new name. And every Egyptian takes upon themselves the new name of Osiris. And so here, Hor, his son, is becoming the father. The father becoming the son. Superman. Superman's father. Abide at the side of the throne of his greatness. You see, this is the part where the scriptures say, on my right hand is my son. The side of the throne. The sheep are on the left, the goats are on the right. <laughs> and so here, Ma'at, Lady of the West. So again, the dead. She's the judge of those who have died and are going on. And so as you saw, that you may live on earth forever. <sighs> no. No. Because this is not what the text is telling us according to uh, Michael Rhodes, because it's all referring to the dead, the West, the Valley of the Kings. Uh, Osiris Hor, the justified forever. In other words, he passed his test at the judgment bar, the scales of judgment. And uh, then Anubis, words spoken by Anubis, who makes protection lord of heaven, foremost of the westerners. 
again you can see that it's referring to the dead even though they're doing a literal translation here there are various types of translation a translator can make I've got the picture glyph or the picture somewhere <coughs> in my uh, files but uh, there are different types of translation this is the kind that I would make do a literal translation, but then I would have an explanation that would explain the West as I'm doing on this video. So the bottom text is the gods of the West, the gods of the cavern, the gods of the South, North, West, and East say, May Osiris Hor, justified, born of Taikhebit, prosper. And and they don't explain who Taikhebet is because the particular book of breathing is for a specific individual, a regular common person, who is enacting the role in their burial, because this was a mummy, this was papyrus from a mummy, that is uh, involved here. This is why it's all for the dead and not for eternal life on earth. And so uh, this is the father. It's the actual person assuming that facsimile 2 belonged with facsimile 3 and the other scroll, the other two scrolls, would then mean that it's Osiris Shishank. That's from facsimile 2. So Osiris is the new name, and Shishank is the deceased with this papyra, and so he's playing the role of Hor as he is dead and is going to become like Osiris. And so his father's name, therefore, born of Takibet is uh, Bayet <coughs> is the name of his father although well yeah that would be Hebrew <coughs> so uh, <coughs> so I've already given you some clues because Joseph Smith inserts biblical characters into this Egyptian text now he's not wrong in doing this because the Bible did it that way. It was a common practice. <laughs> but this is exactly what Joseph Smith had been talking about the whole time. He wants the Bible translated correctly in order to be the Word of God. Current church now, screw correct translation. This is the Bible Joseph Smith used, even though we took out the Apocrypha. And so this is the text we're having, and we're keeping it mistranslated. We're keeping charity as charity, and we're not putting in agape. <laughs> Which means love. <sighs> so, yeah. Joseph Smith understood how the Bible was written. It was translated from the Egyptian texts. I gave you the example of Jesus and the swine and the demons. We are legion. And so this is what Joseph Smith is doing. Exactly what the Bible authors did. And so Osiris becomes Abraham. Just as he said. King Pharaoh? A woman? All Egyptologists should know this. 18th Dynasty. Hepsetsu. She became King Pharaoh. She became King Pharaoh. She was personified as male but she was female because 
David Moses II died too early before David Moses III was old enough to take over the throne himself. He's still a little child. So yes, she went to the Amun priesthood, which because of the too frequent use of the word Amun, they replaced the name Amun with Melchizedek, a longer Hebrew word, Melech, King, Zadok, High Priest. I've done the video talking about Amun in Paleo-Hebrew, which comes from Isaiah's Amun El, Emmanuel, God Amun, Son Amun, Joseph Smith calls him. So, yeah. So that's what we're looking at here, is Joseph Smith is referring to this particular pharaoh, Hepzibah. That Abraham and Hepzibah, Isaac, that's Horus. This is why I don't understand why no Egyptologist could figure this out because they don't have any of these characters in the sign list. And they don't dare. It was the zeitgeist movement of Egyptology with D.M. Murdoch, who is now deceased. Tragic. Who was exposing this. <coughs> and uh, never could develop it into a theory. She just recognized that all of the Bible came from Egyptian. Uh, I'm the one who developed it into a theory. As I was contemporary with her. And, and so, yeah, they should have known. Uh, they should go back and put in all of these characters in the picture glyphs into the sign list thus identify them as such. Uh, but the sign list is only for speaking. That's why they only have the sign list. Unless it is a determinative function. But, no. So, there's a lot of missing words and meaning because they remove these characters from the sign list. And so the the offering table, yeah, well, it, it's Egyptian. It's Egyptian stuff. It's Egyptian plants. So yeah, it's in Egypt. Egyptian. Egypt. Yeah, that's... Joseph Smith is right on that. So here you get to Ma'at, who's in her human form. Horus has already been judged when Ma'at is in the form of the judgment scales. Now she's in her human form. And she's holding Horus's hand. Isaac's hand. What happens when a king takes the throne? Is he just judged at the judgment bar? And he just becomes king? Or is there a prerequisite to also have a wife who is your sister? Abraham chapter 1, Joseph Smith explains why Ham sees Noah's nakedness, but then Noah curses Canaan. It's because Canaan and Egyptus, the daughter of Ham and Egyptus, thus Canaan and Egyptus, our brother and sister, are then cursed. It wasn't about seeing Noah naked. It was about getting Noah to perform a certain ritual in the temple, without a temple, because the flood and the ark on the top of the, the mountain, symbolic of creation, and the mound rising up in the lower waters, 
for childbirth of the birthright blessing son. Yeah. So it has nothing to do with being black. It all has to do with uh, tricking Noah into marrying the two. But if you don't understand the Egyptian, you will not understand how to correct the Bible. But yeah, here you have Isaac in a marriage ceremony. That's why you have mother, not wife. And Joseph correctly identifies her as Hatshepsut. And so Abraham is Pharaoh. Filling in as Pharaoh. Because David Moses II died too early. So now Isaac is taking over the throne. Who would be David Moses III? And of course he has to be sealed to a woman in order to become Pharaoh. Can't be Pharaoh single. And so there she is, his wife and sister, Ma'at. And uh, yeah, women would take the name Ma'at and other Isis and Hathor. That's the names of Egyptian. So yes, in Spanish, you know, Spaniards would have Jesus. in the name of the gods. And so in Die Hard uh, 3, you have Samuel L. Jackson playing Zeus. Not Jesus. <laughs> Zeus. <laughs> so it's, it's very common practice. <laughs> and so yes, Anubis also. Um, and as uh, the Anubis character is not with his Anubis head. Joseph Smith is changing this from an afterlife situation of uh, this actual character from which the papyri comes from for his afterlife and the wife that he had been married to into a biblical story continuing and adding to Abraham and Isaac, transferring priesthood authority of Ammon to his son Isaac, the birthright blessing son. And so uh, not too many years later, like maybe 15 years later, we then get to the story of Abraham taking Isaac to the top of the mountain and slaughtering him as a sacrificial similitude of the latter days <laughs> which is actually the Genesis version is a sign in the heavens indicator for uh, AD 8 April 2020 years before the one that occurs on 8 April 2020 and instead of Russia, it's going to be over the United States of America. So there you go. There's the correct translation of facsimile number three with some added information for you that nobody else will give you. My goodness, 50 minutes for this? Hmm, I'll shower and shave first before I give you this video.